All right, let me start the presentation. Uh, thank you very much for the for the invite. Before I go any further, and um, it's it's a pleasure to to speak with you all um, in South Africa. And I wish you all all the very best in these interesting interesting times. Um, I'm going to talk today about um, uh, a new piece of instrumentation, um, a, a new EM system, TEM system, um, designed uh, for near surface conductivity measurements. So it's a it's a portable system. It's it's run on backpacks, as I'll show you in, in a moment. Um, just like to acknowledge my co-author and the, um, the 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 other founder of this business called Loop Geophysics, and that's uh, Greg Street. And Greg, Greg has a background in, um, in, the, in, in in applying geophysics to applications in the near surface and, and, and other applications, but, but in particular, um, TEM, TEM applications in, in agriculture, um, geological mapping, environmental and engineering um, geophysics. Um, and, and one more thing I wanted to mention before I go on was that this, this talk is basically the same um, with with a few um, more modern wrinkles added, uh, basically the same as a, as a talk I presented at uh, SAGIP, which is the symposium on application of geophysics in engineering and environmental problems, and that's that's a that's a convention that's managed by Environmental and Engineering Geophysical Society based in the US. So uh, apologies for any repetition that you experienced during this this talk. Um, um, I'll, uh, I'll press on. Um, so the, there we are. Um, uh, just adjust my screen a little bit. Okay. So Loop, Loop is a um, is a is a portable EM system, as you can hopefully see from that that graphic there. Um, and it's it's designed to collect uh, TEM data in a in, in uh, while the operators are walking, so so that thereby um, allowing considerable productivity to be achieved, and really the system is is operated at, at walking pace. Um, system takes advantage of of modern develop, developments in electronics and signal processing, and it's it's designed for mapping electrical conductivity in the near surface, as I mentioned. The system is still really um, under under development. It, it's um, it's being used in a commercial fashion in um, in its in its first commercial version, but we are working actively on improvements to the system uh, to make it more applicable to to uh, a range of applications. Um, you can see my co-author Greg there on the right. It's, it's me on the left. Um, in, in that particular photo, we're uh, we're using loop underground and um, modified the direction of the transmitter. I'll, I'll show you a picture of the system in use uh, in a bit more detail in the next slide. I think um, that loop is a is a fully time domain EM system uh, designed. Um, to, to give high high quality high spatial resolution TM data from from uh, from the near surface, um, it it's it's a fairly flexible system in that it can be used with a range of transmitter frequencies. And clearly, that's the that's the transmitter on on my back there, uh, and the receivers on on Greg's back. Um, it's a range of sampling options, but because it's intended to be uh, useful for mapping the near surface, the sampling frequencies are, are quite high. So we typically sample at half a mega sample per second. Um, because it's a, it's a it's a modern development, you, you, you of course imagine that there's full time series data storage and that um, at those sort of sample rates, it takes up a considerable volume of, of memory, uh, but it's quite important we think to, to be able to record that information in case it is required afterwards. However, there, there is a considerable amount of real-time processing going on. Um, so the, the data is processed in real time. And the, one, one of the issues with collecting 
EM data in environmental or engineering applications is that you're typically in, in, a, in a place where there's a lot of interference with EM signals. So system really is designed to generate high quality TEM at, at, at sites like that, that have a lot of EM interference. It's a better shot of the, the uh, system in use. So you can see the transmitter. And the transmitter is designed to be a vertical axis dipole transmitter. Receiver at, at the back there. Um, the the um, transmitter folds up up against the backpack for, for shipping, as you can as you can imagine that would be uh, required. Um, there, there's a cable between the transmitter and receiver. And in that, in that backpack at the rear there, there is, there is no electronics at the moment. All the electronics is in the front backpack. And that all, the, the operator at the front also carries the batteries that power the amplifiers in the receiver antenna at the back. The uh, receive coil is, um, is designed to, to, to measure at early times. So it has a bandwidth over 100 kilohertz. And it's sampled at 500,000 samples a second, roughly. And, and we do get useful data within several microseconds of the transmitter switch off. Now the transmitter is a, is a fairly typical 50% square wave, 50% uh, duty cycle square wave transmitter switched off in about eight microseconds. And the transmitter moment is around 100 amp turn square meters. Um, you might, consider that to be quite small and, and you'd be right, it is, it is quite small, but we can't um, justify putting a larger moment system on, on someone's back. There are, there are international guidelines about the exposure of humans to uh, magnetic fields, even low frequency magnetic fields like this. And the system is designed to, to sit well within the limits required for that. And also the limits required for the exposure of the public to fields like that. We typically run the, the transmitter at 75 hertz um, in, a, in a country where you've got 50 hertz power lines, um, but lower and higher frequencies are available. In a resistive terrain, we might operate the system at several hundred hertz. Um, just a quick look at, at potential mining applications for the system, all, all the usual suspects for TEM, um, direct exploration for near surface uh, metal sulfides or graphite. And we've done plenty of examples of that um, and or mapping the, the grade of metal, uh, the grade in, in metal mines, whether they're open cut or, or underground. Mapping geology grade and, and hazards in, in open cut mining operations. Um, and detection of, of conductive ore, I mentioned that in underground mines, um, mapping water content or salinity in, in tailings dam walls or other mining related waste dumps and the mapping of acid mine drainage. And the, the more applications that we pursue with this system, um, the, more, the more I've realized that conduct, electrical conductivity really is a, um, is a tremendous physical property for, um, uh, for understanding a lot, of, a lot of different problems. So electrical conductivity is, is a very good surrogate for a lot of other um, physical descriptions of materials. Uh, you might wanna think about other applications for this, um, obviously engineering and um, environmental applications. And we've, um, Done a number of those, um, and there's some examples there. The, the picture there was actually from a survey where we were trying to find a, um, a contaminant plume um, underneath some wetlands, um, which was coming from an industrial site. Um, other things, mapping of cavities, saline incursions at coasts and, and rivers, um, we have the problem of land salinity here in, in, our, um, in our drylands. Um, 
And so get, you can get salinization of land uh, relating to ir irrigation and deforestation. Um, and clearly en engineering applications where you want to understand a bit about the regolith. Uh, the systems in a couple of fairly comfortable backpacks, we, we had a, um, an industrial design company involved in the, in the development of this so that the, the backpacks were um, as wearable as, as, as possible. They're not, they're not particularly heavy. They're both uh, less than 12 kilos. Um, but the, the system really had to be wearable in a, in a way that an operator could wear this for an entire day, entire working day, um, obviously without incurring any manual handling injuries or um, discomfort. It's, it's got significant real-time processing power, um, enough to process that 500,000 samples per second on the three components in, in real time, in other words, stack and, and window it um, and, and display it. And it's typically displayed on a, on a um, handheld Windows tablet um, or any, any Wi-Fi enabled um, browser can be used to, to interrogate data coming out of that system. Uh, it's obviously GPS is, is an important integrated part of this system. It's, it's not an add-on. It's, uh, it's an important part of the system for not only synchronizing measurements with um, between transmitter and receiver or between this system and other transmitters, uh, but also for mapping where, where you've traversed. Um, and there's, there's navigation system, an, op an operator navigation system built into the, the GUI that we use on this system. But the system batteries have an endurance of three to four hours and they, and they can be hot swapped. System batteries are quite small. We use two, uh, if you can see me, you can see this battery. Uh, we use two batteries about this size. They're less than 100 watt hours, the, the sort of size that can be um, air freighted around with equipment. Um, and those batteries, those two batteries last three to four hours. And if you, if you pull one of them out and swap it around, then you can pull the other one out, swap it around without interrupting the, the system operation. We've also done some work in, in fixed loop. So there's no reason why we can't synchronize our receiver. That's the receiver there on the, on the right with um, any other transmitter system. Um, so th thereby collecting a lot of received data using a, using a bigger transmitter or a bigger moment. So some examples, and I think the rest of this presentation will be mostly um, examples. This is an example from a, um, a loop survey that was carried out a couple of years ago over an, an outcropping graphite deposit. Um, and what's shown in the, on the right there is um, uh, a, a contour and image of a late time channel. So the data was collected at 75 hertz. So the late time windows there are um, three milliseconds or so, I, I think. Um, and this is the last time window. It's, it's, it's quite a conductive thing and, and it's outcropping. So the, the, the um, graphite is, is quite visible at the surface. There's not a lot of weathering here. In, in this particular survey, uh, about five kilometres, five linear kilometres of, of data was collected in about an hour of walking through um, reasonably bushy sort of, sort of terrain. And you can see the, the path followed there on, the, on that diagram, and it's really just looping back and forth across the, uh, across the surface projection of that graphite deposit in lines that are about 50 metres apart, roughly. We, we were walking along old drilling tracks and this particular deposit has been drilled out pretty well and, and, is, and is well understood. So we typically um, take each two seconds of data and stack that and window that. So at 75 hertz, um, two seconds is 150 periods of, of, uh, of data, stack that, and we typically overlap the stacks so that one second later we'll spit out another two seconds of, of, um, of stack, so they're overlapped. 
so you, you end up with a reading every meter or two, um, depending on the walking speed. And that's, that's a lot of data. Um, it's overkill for some situations where, you, where you're trying to map um, something that's, that's fairly one dimensional or, or not changing much as you walk along. Uh, nonetheless, that's the, that's, the, that's the typical sort of survey specs for, uh, for what we've been doing. Um, this particular data set outlined this, this graphite deposit pretty well over a length of several hundred metres and, and down to depths of 25 metres plus, probably um, a, bit, a bit more than that. Um, we typically would, would say that we can um, measure electrical conductivity down to 25, 30 metres, that, that kind of thing. But if, if you've got the perfect DM target, um, we can probably see it at 40 metres plus with this system, even while walking. As an underground mining example, we didn't discover that, that nice chunk of gold there, but we, were, we did a survey in a mine where that had been discovered. It's a, it's a beta hunt underground nickel gold mine in, um, in Cambelda, which is in the West Australian gold fields. Um, this particular mine made the news big time in 2018 with the discovery of a, of a whole room full of gold, um, about 30,000 ounces for the Father's Day run. The, the, gold, the gold was discovered uh, where a shear zone intersected a, a sediment horizon. There's plenty of associated sulfides. So the application for an EM survey here was um, real, realistically to, to try and find um, pyrotite slash pyrite, good targets. But there was, of course, the hope that, that we might find, um, directly find, something like um, what is in the, the uppermost picture there. Um, the survey was done at, at 25 Hertz, um, which is lower than we'd normally operate, but the steel mesh in the mine um, presents a, a, a very nice target. And um, we still had plenty of signal at, at uh, 10 milliseconds. Um, so we, we were running it at uh, 25 Hertz, which is, about a third of the frequency we'd normally run at. Um, there were some really nice targets generated in the survey. That's a, that's a profile with a log vertical scale there of the three components measured um, along one particular drive. Um, it's a very 3D um, environment in which to, um, to do EM targets above, beside, below. Um, quite a complex data set, but there were some clear conductive targets coming through the very strong response from the, from the steel mesh in these tunnels. Uh, and many of them were, um, were drilled um, with, a, with a technical success. No room falls of gold came out of this survey, um, but, but uh, targets yielded some sulphide-rich zones, which which were drilled, and um, so that that was a, that was a reasonable technical success. Um, and in addition to the the sort of normal Z axis ver, Z vertical axis transmitter configuration that we'd normally use with the system, we did turn the transmitter on its side, as in that picture earlier in the presentation. So a, a cross line um, transmitter axis configuration that was really put in there to to help energize a target that might be alongside, though on, on, on either side of the drive. An example from a, a waste dump here in Perth. Um, this, this is a survey that we've done many times um, as, part of, um, as, as, as part of proving up the, this system. Um, it's, it's now a, a sports field in a Perth suburb was at one point a landfill site. There's plenty of um, metal buried here, um, and um, and conductive landfill in the site. Um, just an example to show um, an environmental application. That, that's that survey is, is roughly 150 meters by 100 meters, something like that. It was done at five meter spacing. Um, 
and, and these things can be done pretty quickly because they're all done at, at walking pace. Um, we established that the, the boundary of the landfill side along with the presence of buried metal. And I think that picture there is probably a, oh, that's an early time um, vertical component response showing there. So lines about five metres apart, which is which is sort of been fairly typical for the environmental examples that we've done. Um, a regolith mapping example in, in the mining industry, of course, this is um, this is an example from First Quantum Minerals um, Ravensthorpe Nickel Mine, which is a laterite nickel deposit. Um, this particular survey was done over an area that's been proposed for a new part of the mine. And the application here was mapping um, conductivity, um, conductivity variations between fairly close spaced drill holes. So the, the, the regolith has variations in thickness and conductivity here that relate to the nickel laterite horizons that are being mined here. Um, the image shown here is once again, it's an early time picture of um, basically raw, raw data out of the system about six microseconds after the transmitter switched off. Uh, these traverses are between 25 and 50 metres apart. And re readings about every 1.5 metres. And there was a lot of data, 30 kilometres of data collected here in, in, in roughly two working days. This was quite early in the, in the history of the development of this system. So there, there was, um, there's, there's been quite some comparison between this data set and um, a, a broader airborne EM data set that's been carried out over the same year. It's, it's really been part of, um, uh, it's, it's been a very useful data set to use in, in the calibration of this system. Um, from the same data set, these are profiles and sections about, about one kilometre in, in length. There's a CDI there produced by Emax Air, which is um, developed by Peter Fulliger at Fulliger Geophysics. Uh, that CDI is draped on the DTM at the bottom of that uh, picture there, and shows the variation of depth to a, a conductive layer in the in the regolith, um, and the variation in near surface conductivity. So that's a bit, the, the grid at the bottom there is a ten meter vertical grid between the, the squares. Um, other, other loop studies of this sort of nature, um, just comparing similar studies, have, have been done to um, map variations in superficial clay type used in the production of house bricks. So there's, we, we've stumbled on plenty of applications for mapping um, regolith conductivity for uh, engineering and, and other applications. This is an example from gold exploration. Um, an Australian explorer called Nelson Resources um, did detailed loop surveys on, on gold and nickel prospects uh, in Western Australia last year. And there's a, a, a grid of fairly mid time. So that's probably several hundred microseconds. I'm not sure it's written on there. Several hundred microseconds delay. Um, basically the, the raw response from the system at, 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 at that delay. So several hundred microseconds after the transmitter switched off. Um, a beautiful map of uh, something. I'm not, I'm not um, the full bottle on the, on the geology here. Um, however, this, this data was used in conjunction with other data, you know, MAG and, and Geochem in, in um, analyzing the structure in this area. And, um, and, and planning um, drill fences. It's the, the area's only got very shallow weathering, as you might imagine from that, from that picture. Um, so near surface geophysics is, is very useful in, in uh, mapping features in essentially un, unweathered bedrock. But you can see that this company has interpreted faults um, based on the, on the EM data. It's, it's, a, it's quite a stunning image really of, of EM data um, and really does look like potential field data in, in that context. Um, all right. Um, talk about open cut 
mines before. Um, the system's been used at several of the um, uh, open cut um, channel iron deposits in the northwest of Western Australia, in our um, Pilbara region. So this is a, a photo from a survey um, in, in, a, in a, an open cut iron ore mine. And, and the, this, is a, this is a channel iron deposit. The channels are typically several hundred metres wide. Um, and walking along one of those is um, pretty easy going because it's, um, it's, it's pretty flat apart from the odd uh, boulders sticking up. Very hot though, usually. So this was one of the hottest and dustiest surveys this, this ski has ever done. I, I didn't mention the transmitter receiver spacing. So the transmitter receiver spacing there is roughly 10 metres. And that's, that's a pretty typical kind of spacing that we tend to use. You can imagine applications where you might want to be a little bit closer than that when you're trying to map something that's that is very much in the near surface. Um, so you know, perhaps something in the in the first few meters rather than the first couple of tens of meters. And we're getting our heads around how to how to make those measurements with the transmitter and receiver very close together. This particular example is fairly typical at at, at a ten meter spacing. Some of the data from that. From that survey, um, let's see. This is this is once again fairly early time data. This is a very resistive terrain, so these these deposits are very resistive. Um, this is data from six microseconds as well, and the, the image mainly shows variations in the depth to the conductive basement here. The, the basement is not that conductive, but um, more conductive than the channel iron fill that's that is in the channel. So in, in this in this example, the channel boundary is at the at the, at the top right. Um, the center of the channel is to, to the bottom left, and this is probably um, mapping the third or, or or a quarter of the width of the channel. So we're we're just at the part of the channel near the channel boundary here. Um, the, the the data clearly shows the deepening of the of the channel uh, as you go towards its center and, and shows the structure of the basement and, and, and more conductive clay zones in the channel near the, near the um, northern edge of this channel. One other reason for uh, doing EM in this, in this kind of um, situation is, is to map hazards for the mining operation. If there are um, lumps of clay within the channel iron material, it's good to know about them ahead of time. Can't say that we um, we've identified any of those in, in particular in in our in our limited work in this environment, um, but it's it, that is that is a, a valuable application for EM in a channel iron deposit. Tailing storage facilities, so another mining related application. Um, now this is a, a little bit of a a hot topic um, in our industry. Um, I think this system really is is right at the sweet spot for for this kind of um, this kind of study. So, mapping electrical conduct electrical conductivity in the top few tens of meters tells you quite a lot about um, about structures like the wall of a tailings dam. We've done. Um, or, or our, our customers have done upwards of 10 or, or a dozen studies at, at tailings dams. Um, I don't have any of those that I can publish aside from the from this example, which, which is in the public domain. Um, and this is from a, a paper um, produced in the EEGS's Fast Times um, magazine. And the, and the titles there. Uh, it was authored by Remke Van Dam, who uh, uh, is uh, based here at Southern Geoscience in, uh, in Perth. He's got an interest in near surface geophysics. He's done a comparison here of loop data versus some, some older 
EM34 data. That's, that's quite an interesting comparison. The Batalings Dam is, is, the, is the cutout feature at the bottom of each of these four diagrams. Uh, there's, there's old EM34 data uh, at the bottom here, and the top two images are two separate time windows from the, from the loop data set that he collected. Um, the traverses for the loops, uh, the loop data is shown there with those lines. Um, so here, uh, the, the readings for the EM, EM34 data shown here with dots. So in other words, stationary readings. These are all, um, the loop data is all collected while moving. Uh, I think there's a bit of analysis of that here. Um, another, another picture from Remke's paper. Um, location of this travis is on the previous slide. So it's, it's the travis across the middle here and east-west travis across the middle, uh, across that conductive feature. And there's a CDI at the bottom of that showing um, uh, Remke's effort to calculate the conductivity distribution there. Um, that conductive feature seems to be coincident with um, with elevated groundwater conductivity, and that's been established from, from measurements in bores there. And it, it appears to be um, associated with um, a drainage line and um, potentially the result of an overflow event at the pond between the times of those two surveys. M34 is a um, like a, a bicycle wheel EM system, uh, frequency domain, um, single channel, I think. Um, more examples here. This is a, um, a another mining example over a um, a Gossen in the in the West Australian wheat belt, though not too far from Perth. Here, uh, three components of loop data shown there. That's twenty meters per radicule in that in that um, grid there. This is over a known target that dips the east at about 60 degrees. And the location of the Gossen for that target is shown on the, on the diagram there. The data was collected in, in unconventional moving loop, loop configuration. So the transmitter and receiver moving along at a 10 meter spacing at, at walking pace. So generating a reading there every meter or two along a travis. Now that's a fairly steeply dipping target, but we can see it um, probably 60, 80 metres um, down dip of the, um, along the surface from the, the surface expression of that, of that uh, deposit. At the same, on the same day, we did a fixed loop survey. It's the first and probably one of the only fixed loop surveys we've done with, with this system. In other words, a, a transmitter loop on the ground with a, with a fairly conventional transmitter, in this case, something fairly lightweight, only 12 amps into a 100 metre loop but we used the mobile uh, recording receiver to walk lines. So a fixed loop there, but um, mobile recording um, to give us some, uh, some productivity. And this survey was done at a lower frequency than we would normally operate because we've got a, a big transmitter sitting there, 25 Hertz. So, and, and there you can see that we can, we can see that the response from that, that conductor um, much further away. So hundreds of metres away rather than just a, a few tens or uh, 50 metres away. So there's another potential application, another potential geometry um, option for that system. Um, getting towards the end here, um, but as I mentioned, we, we do, um, well, we are carrying out a fair bit of um, ongoing development of this system. Um, we want it to be easier to use um, and we want better data out of it. We want the same as all our customers. Um, to do that, we want to make um, data delivery from this thing um, fairly rapid. We want some real-time feedback on conductivity depth sections in real time so that people on the survey themselves have a good feel for um, whether they need to 
do infill, etc. So we want and we want to make the the operators experience um, uh, in, informative, you know, a bit more feedback to the operator. We want to build in VLF resistivity measurements where we're receiving right across the normal VLF spectrum. There's no reason why we can't make VLF measurements with this system. The, 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 only, the only caveat on that is that the system is moving, it's walking along, it's, it's, it's on the, the back of someone who's moving. It's, it's, so it's not a nice stable platform from which to measure small variations in, in the polarization of, of VLF fields. So along with, along with measuring VLF, we need to correct for motion and system orientation. And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, people who contributed to these uh, to the data sets and uh, analysis that I presented in this talk, and and they are listed there, um, uh, including uh, mining companies, consultants, um, people like Peter Fulliger, who's been working on fine tuning CDIs for this application, CSIRO, who actually own one of these systems. CSIRO is a research organisation in Australia, own one of these systems because they get involved in um, interesting projects in engineering and groundwater. Um, and I think that's just about it. The what, one thing I did forget to mention was that, um, that, that Greg and I are interested in, um, in getting these Systems out. It's a it's it's a um, system will be sold. It's it's not uh, something we're going to operate as a service business. The intention is to make these as these systems um, as useful as possible and get them out to people who are in service industries or are in the business of of understanding their mine or their engineering problem a little bit better. So with that, I'll uh, I'll wrap up. And I think I'll probably stop sharing my screen. Is that right, Ollie? Um, Andrew, you can get on sharing the screen just in case anyone wants to like go back to a specific slide. Okay. Um, for the questions, um, for the questions section. Great presentation. Thank you so much for taking us through it. Um, so far, we have uh, one question from the audience. Um, so, if anyone has any questions, please don't forget to type them in in, in the chat. Um, Reese, uh, Reese from Durham saying, great looking data, Andrew. Are the TXRX separation and orientation measured on the fly? At the moment, Reese, at the moment, they, um, they're not actively measured. Um, Where we will have um, compass and accelerometers in the, the next generation of the hardware. Um, accelerometers don't tell you everything you want to know about the orientation because you're moving so they're just measuring the acceleration so they they're telling you what the operator is doing as well as the, the way the system's moving um, the data itself is a rich source of information about the geometry of the system so you have the you have the the um, primary field uh, you also have um, vlf fields um, and they tell you a lot about the orientation of the system um, and, and along with a few other things that we can pull out of the data. So um, that, that side of things will really uh, improve and, and clearly part of the data set needs to be um, the, the orientation of the system. And we can, once we've got that, then we can correct the data for gross variations in orientation, um, as you might imagine. That's great. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we have a question from Stefan that we see. Um, very cool system, Andrew. Great idea. And the question is, could one get rid of the internet interconnecting cable in the future? Yes. Thanks for the question, Stefan. The, 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 that is the, the primary goal of the next um, part of the engineering of the system. Um, uh, for a couple of reasons, but the, the obvious reason is that it it um, it's going to speed things up um, if it's not if the receiver and transmitter are not tethered together, um, and it, and it, and it allows for um, multitude of other possibilities. So um, 
the, the thing that we need to overcome with the engineering there is that we need to be able to put the the data acquisition electronics fairly close to the receiver coil, as you might imagine. Looking at that picture there, um, you can see the, the backpack that the receiver operator has and the proximity um, between the, the distance between that and the coil. So if you'll have a, a bunch of electronics, which is um, uh, less than a meter from the, the sensor. Um, so we need to make that electronics um, fairly quiet from a, you know, a, an EM radiation standpoint. And that's the next, that's one of the next steps of the, the development. Um, so um, yeah, you hit the nail on the head there, Stefan. It's, um, it will make the system more usable. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Jakob Smith is um, asking what would be the depth limitation when searching for large metallic objects um, size of the car, let's say, in the resistant terrain? Uh, thanks for the question, Jaco. Um, uh, it'll, it'll be a guess, but it, I, I think something the size of a car in, in resistive terrain, uh, you might be looking at, I, I, I'm just, just guessing, maybe between um, 10 and 15 metres, if that's a solid metallic object. Um, but, you know, I think I think more than that, you, you might run into um, you might run into the noise level. Um, so that's kind of a guess. We've 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 had a play with um, s smaller geometries. You know, trying to trying to make this thing work for UXO, um, and the, the system really wasn't designed to work close enough to have the transmitter and receiver close enough for UXO applications. Um, for a, for a bigger target, um, you know, potentially 10 or 15 metres deep, we can operate in the, with a normal, say, five to 10 metre spacing, I'm sure. And, and my gut feeling would be that you'd probably see it at perhaps, um, you know, 10 to 15 metres, that, that kind of thing. Thanks, That's Andrew. just a guess, really. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have another question or comment from the audience from Capondo, Capondo T, great system, Andrew. Thank you. What is the maximum depth of the near surface system depending, depending of course, on the ground? I presume. In, in, um, yeah, um, in, in, uh, in perfect circumstances. So the, the, perfect, the perfect EM target is, is, a, uh, is a conductive layer, um, you know, a horizontal conductive layer. Um, and uh, or, or half space, you know, buried half space, the, and 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 exactly what's the what is the what is the the perfect conductivity of that? I I, I couldn't tell you, but um, for the sort of frequencies we're running at, um, you know, it might it might be a hundred ohm meters or, or perhaps perhaps a little bit more conductive than that. Um, we we gather we can probably see that at forty meters, um, and and perhaps. Perhaps even a little, a little bit more. Um, it's going to depend on the frequency we're running at. It might depend on uh, exactly how much interference there is from the motion of the operators, um, and it might depend a little bit on um, the presence of, of say, uh, power lines or what have you. But in general, we we do seem to do pretty well, even in in built up areas around mine sites where there's. Um, a lot of power lines running around, so that's that's kind of my guess there again. Um, Forty meters, we can, we we sh I should have that number um, available to give you, and and we can come up with it by modelling the system response because we know the noise levels, of course. Um, but it'll be around that sort of depth, around forty meters. Thanks, Andrew. I think this is uh, <clears throat> the next question is repeat of the question that you just um, answered from Paul okay. Chapel. Um, also, just a comment. Great work, indeed. Maybe I have missed this one. What is the depth limit? Um, I presume, like you said, it would be about forty meters, depending on the job. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we, the the things we could do to increase that, if it was required in this in this type of application, would be to run more transmitter power. Um, that's very difficult um, with the transmitter on someone's back. If you put the transmitter on a 
a cart and moved it a little bit further away from the operator, then that's that becomes simpler. And it also it also becomes a lot simpler to make the loop a lot bigger when it's not um, anchored to someone's backpack like that. Um, and then with with a cart, um, of course, you could put the um, you could probably put a bigger a lower noise receiver coil on it. Um, things get a lot easier. Um, we, we've been working with backpack mounted systems now as part of the, the first generation of this technology. There'll be other incarnations of this uh, instrument, no doubt, um, in the future. Um, the, the backpack mounted system seems to have filled a bit of a hole um, in, in, in the application where to, terrain is quite difficult. And um, a lot of the surveys we've been involved in would, would have been in terrain that you couldn't get any kind of vehicle or cart through. Um, but it seems that um, it's, it's not that hard for guys, even, even with these backpacks on, to, to get through. Um, and the backpacks aren't really that heavy. Um, and it means that, that, that operators can get through terrain that's, uh, that would be otherwise um, a, a candidate for a very unproductive EM survey. Yeah, and you just um, visually, uh, loop system looks pretty ergonomic. I've spent some time with Maxman EM34 and uh, it looks pretty, you know, ergonomic in terms of its design. We have another question from uh, Brad. Great presentation, Andrew. Any tests or plans for multiple receivers? Yes, and that's that's a lot easier, Brad, without the, the tether, as you can imagine, without the cable between the transmitter and receiver, it would be almost impossible um, to, to tether um, the transmitter to multiple receivers. Um, of course, you could, we, we could all, all the all the receiver electronics is in that front backpack as well and we could we could have another operator carrying another system around but that would mean four operators for a total of two two receiver measurements um, with with gps sync everything is is simple um, once we've got rid of that cable then there'll be any number of operators any number of receiver operators that that you would want um, then that will be synchronized with the, the transmitter. They could be walking alongside the transmitter or in front and behind. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, in, un, in underground applications, as you might imagine, um, that, that it, it, it could become very nice to collect multiple receivers along with the, the transmitter. Um, you know, and, they might, and they might be in adjacent tunnels or, or ahead of or behind the, the transmitter or, or even above them, a level above and a level below. Um, so there's, there's, there's plenty of options there. And, and you, you, could probably, um, you could probably treat the, um, the, re the receivers, if, the, either these or other receivers as, as stationary systems and walk past them with a transmitter. You know, that's another way of operating. You know, that, that style of survey would only require one operator, um, a mobile transmitter operator. So there's, there's, there's a bunch of options there, I think. Um, uh, yeah. Great. Um, we have another question and comment from Lisella Hobson. Great system, Andrew. How far out in time are you reading? So um, Marcella, at, at 75 hertz, it's, it's a standard 50% duty cycle measurement. So it's, um, one on 75 is the, is the full period. Um, What's that? It's, 12, so it's it's around three milliseconds on and three milliseconds off. So um, you've got three milliseconds of off time there. That underground example I showed um, in that gold mine uh, was run at twenty five hertz. So it's ten milliseconds on and ten off. Um, the system's capable of physically of, of doing any of any any frequency. Um, if you go much below seventy five, the motion of the um, the receiver operator starts to impact very negatively on the, the noise on the, the system. So, and this is the same, this is the same logic that, that drives airborne EM systems to, to work at 
at higher frequencies than ground systems. Obviously, the frequencies are coming down now, but um, the motion of the receiver operator and it and it can be quite a it can be quite a vigorous motion, as you might imagine. You know, especially walking in country like that that you're seeing in that photo. That motion means that the um, the system has has much better signal to noise at frequencies like 75 hertz and upwards. And we've done we've done surveys at several hundred hertz in resistive terrain. And and of course the at several hundred hertz you're well above the the, the noise that's induced by the, the motion of the receiver operator. So if you want to go to low frequency, um, it's, it becomes quite difficult um, with a backpack receiver system like that. Understandable. Thanks, Andrew. And uh, the seller just um, just commented that his question was more about the noise limitations that you alluded to. Um, so thank you so much for actually going, going in depth and um, just commenting on that. We have another question and comment from Klaus. Um, great system, Andrew. A, any ballpark idea of the cost of the system um, that you're showing here? Um, the, the ballpark number is is roughly 100,000 Australian dollars. Um, that's that's a ballpark. Um, we're still pretty early in the uh, development and sales of these systems. Um, it, 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 it could change a little bit in the next generation of systems um, because there'll be some slightly different features added um, and hopefully one feature removed, which is the, which is the cable. Um, that, that may not help all that much, Klaus, in reducing the cost. In fact, we're gonna be adding um, plenty of electronics to the system because there'll be effectively duplicated electronics in the transmitter and receiver then. Um, anyway, that's a that's a ballpark um, number. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, that that makes sense. Uh, the umbilical cord, I think, needs to go. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you so much uh, for everyone tuning in. To everyone tuning in and all the questions, um, Andrew. Huge thanks for the talk. Very interesting system, and um, you know, please keep us posted um, when you when you're planning to market it, sell it, and we'll be keen to see the system in Southern Africa applied in mineral exploration. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. And thanks again for the invitation to, to talk, um, Ollie and, uh, and, and Brad. Yeah, huge um, thanks to and Brad for, <clears throat> for organizing and, and getting everything lined up. We had great attendance today at about 20 people plus minus tuned in for the talk. So a huge thanks to everyone tuning in. Andrew, I just have a last question. Um, could once um, we finish the talk, could we publish the recording of the talk on our Saga YouTube channel? Absolutely, yeah. Perfect. No um, Andrew, huge thanks. And um, uh, yeah. Yeah, thank, well, thanks to all of you and, and all the best of luck um, to, to all of you. Um, and I hope to catch up with you in, in person sometime in, in the not so distant future. No, absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, everyone. We're gonna we're gonna close the talk. Have a great Friday and awesome weekend.